Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kay Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It is wonderful to be back, Owen, in our little studio. Yes, it is. Uh, for those of you that are viewing, you can see behind us what looks like eggshells. And what you can't see is a partially completed studio. Mm. Um, we are recording uh, with the best side of the studio at the moment. And Kate, you do have a coffee there, a latte. Yeah, from Vacation, our one of our favourites in Melbourne. Yes, Vacation Coffee House. It's um, it's where it's stuff from Flinders. From the street station, if you know that. Uh, but Kate, we're not talking about coffee today as much as we want to brag about our soy lattes or regular lattes. We're talking about ethical ETFs and in particular the Ethi ETF. This is a deep dive. Yes. And this was chosen by the community, which I'll get you to run through in just a minute. But first, just a disclosure, a disclaimer, all that sort of stuff. Even if we talk about the ETFs on the program, it's important to remember that uh, this is limited to general financial advice. If we talk about an ETF or any type of investing, it's important to remember that we're not tailoring this to you. That's what you need to see a financial planner for. And in particular for ETFs, they are a form of managed fund. So that means they issue what's called a PDS, a product disclosure statement. Be sure to read that before you go through and invest in anything. Um, Any ETF has them and they explain all the taxes, the fees, the risks, that sort of stuff. Mm. And Owen mentioned the word disclosure. And for full disclosure, Mm -hmm. neither Owen or I own a position in the FE ETF. Nor do we have a relationship with beta shares or anything like that. No, and so. you can't invest directly as an individual in beta shares because it is a private company. It is a private company, yes. So, um, Kate, talk to us about this poll. What yes. Did, what did the people say? So, if you've been listening for a while now, you'll know about our regular ETF or share deep dives each month. And so, this month, I framed it around ethical ETFs. And so, we got the data from our best ETFs uh, website, mm-hmm. um, found the five or so most popular ETFs the ethical ETS people were looking at and um, gave it over to the audience to decide. And I guess I'll just mention them because I think when you're looking at different ETS, it's good to have a few different options to start with mm. um, just for your research. And so one of them, which we're going to talk about today, was the BetaShares Global Sustainability Leaders ETF, which mm-hmm. is ASX ETHI, E-T-H-I, on your for your brokerage account if you're having a look. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was also the VanEck, VanEck, what am I saying? MSCI International Sustainability Equity ETF. The ticket code for that is ESGI. Mm -hmm. There was the BetaShares Ethical Diversified High Growth ETF, which was a close runner-up in the poll, Mm -hmm. um, ticket code DZZF. So we've talked about VDHG in one of our deep dives before. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a little bit similar, but with a different lens. Uh, there's the Vanguard Ethically Conscious International Shares ETF, ticket code VESG, and the Beta Shares Australian Sustainability Leaders ETF, ticket code FAIR, F-A-I-R. And these aren't all the same ETFs. Some are international, some are Australian, some are a mix of everything. One is even a diversified portfolio, so it's got a bit of everything in there. But they're interesting ones to have a look at if you are looking more into ethical and sustainable ETFs and some different options there. Yeah, I think the reason why, well, one of the, there's many reasons, but if we just look at the data for the uh, ETHI ETF, uh, I'm using data from, this is from the Best ETFs website until uh, 31st of December, 2021. So this is the calendar year, 2021. Um, and that's not necessarily the longest period for to judge an ETF. We should be looking at at least three years. But in this instance, this is the top performing sustainable or air quotes, ethical ETF. And the reason I'm saying air quotes, for those of you that aren't watching the video, is that we some people, like this is an ethical ETF. That's how people identify it. However, I think it's important to differentiate between ethical and sustainable. In our ethical investing course, we make this point. We say that basically ethics is a personal thing. It's a personal decision. What are your values and how do the, your values, you know, Uh, How are they reflected in your portfolio? That's very hard to capture in one ETF. I don't think anyone wakes up every day and and goes, oh, the ETHI ETF is my ethics. 
No one really says that, but it's clear that it's a sustainability focused ETF. So with fossil fuels excluded, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so it, let's let's frame it as a, what it is, a sustainability ETF or like an ETF focused on sustainability. But from 2021, the ETHI ETF returned around about 31%, which was the most of the ethical ETFs on the ASX. Just beat the VESG ETF. Um, and so it's obvious that why well, it's popular. Like it's done really well. Mm. Um, it's also big it's yeah. got over two billion dollars invested in it where some of them are only you know 50 billion uh, 50 yeah. million sorry um so they're quite a bit smaller the fees aren't that high no. and the marketing's good mm. and i think as we'll get into a little bit further on uh, part of the performance is because it has a lot of tech companies in it u.s yeah. tech companies which That's have right. done really well over the past few years yeah exactly so we'll lift the lid on this in just a minute but it's easy to see why it's popular thank you for those of you who voted remember that we do do shares one month and ETFs the next. So jump into the Facebook group. There's a link in the show notes. Jump in there, have your say. Um, we we listened and we've we've got a few companies coming up, which are basically what came second or what was nominated by other people in our community, not just us. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's let's dig into it. All right. Some quick fire facts on the BetaShares Global Sustainability Leaders ETF before we dive into the more interesting bits about how the ETF actually filters companies. Mm -hmm. But according to BetaShares, this ETF aims to track the performance of an index, which in this case is the NASDAQ Future Global Sustainability Leaders Index. And when I had a look, they've pretty much created this index just for BetaShares to use because no other ETFs Hmm. are actually using this index. Um, And it's just a portfolio, I think we had a look before, was it 200 companies or so, um, of large global companies that are identified as climate leaders that have also passed screens to Um, what are they saying? There's large global companies that are identified as climate leaders. um, So they're excluding companies that have significant exposure to fossil fuel or are engaged with other activities that are deemed inconsistent with their responsible investment considerations, which I'll mention a bit further because they do have a filtering process and a whole Mm -hmm. range of different... You can really see what the viewpoints are on different issues, like even junk foods mentioned in there. So I thought that was an interesting one. And it's also been certified by the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia, RIAA, Mm -hmm. as part of their Responsible Investment Certification Program. So it's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah, so the RIAA is something that you'll see across a lot of managed funds and ETFs. Um, Interestingly, some of the funds, like say Vanguard's Ethical Solutions, they don't post things front and center, you know, like we've done this, we've done that on the ethical side. I don't know why. Maybe it's like a decision that they consciously make. But beta shares are front and center. They're saying this is an ethical or sustainability yeah. ETF. This is what it does. This is who we've been certified by. So they make it very clear. Um, and I think they do have quite a leg to stand on here because they were one of the first in this space. And also it is a good ETF from a screening point mm. of view, whereas some of the... We, we, I know we've got a comment on this from the Facebook group. Is basically like, is it greenwashing? Like, is it this is is this the the investment firm's version of saying that this is good for the planet? Um, where this actually is, mm. yeah. By all accounts, this actually seems to do what it says. So yeah. that's nice. And it's been going for a while. So mm-hmm. it's started around in January 2017. So quite yeah. a long-standing Australian ethical ETF. Mm-hmm. A lot of them have only jumped in the bandwagon on the last couple of years. So this has been around for a really long time. And I think the funds under management is also reflective of its yeah. track record and how long it has been around for. That's it. So it's got two things for going for it. One, it was like one of the earliest in this space. And two, it's got really good performance. So what does that mean? Well, financial advisors can recommend it because it's been around for long enough so they've got a good, good track record and people that were already investing it in it are keeping their money invested or investing more because it's done so well yeah so then it just keeps feeding on itself and so that's why it's so much bigger than the others mm. yeah i was amazed when i saw it, it was two mm. billion dollars funds under management yeah it's a huge etf by australian standards yeah uh, particularly given it's like a niche one we could still say maybe it's not so much niche anymore but it, it's still one that people are Um, Like it's not normal, we could say that. Um, So the ETF registry, just a quick mention of that, is Link Market Services, like all beta shares funds. So this is where you'd go. You'd go to Link Market Services to register for a distribution reinvestment plan if you want your dividends to be continually invested. Add your Uh, tax file number, change your bank account details. Yep, all that sort of stuff. Make sure you do that because you'll... You know, it's, it's good for tax. It's easier. Um, and it also allows you to just manage your investments. If you've got a link account, you can do it all in one account. Okay. Yeah. And management fees are 0.59% per year. So that's $5.90 per $1,000 you invest in the ETF. Yeah. And 
this I know we're, this is like one of the again one of the points maybe it's worth covering here. So 0.59% that's taken out automatically every day. Yep. So you don't notice that it comes out of the share price. You do not get a bill. Yep. And um, that's well, like, they'd love, they love that, right? Because you yeah. don't actually know. Imagine if you went to Maccas and you didn't ever see the bill. You just got the Maccas. <laughs> um, you would just go there every day. So the, the, the thing about this is one of the questions and one of the pieces of feedback that we always get is, why would you invest in Ethi when you can invest in one of the diversified front funds for a lesser fee? So it's just a... Um, backtrack on this a little bit. So with Ethi, you get global exposure. With FAIR, you get Aussie exposure. So the two different ETFs, F-A-I-R and E-T-H-I. One is global, one is Australian. You can bundle them together in a pre-made. Remember those diversified ETFs that we've talked about? That's um, one of the ETFs that we've recommended in the past at RASC is the DZZF ETF. Now, this is still very small, which I'm surprised about. Because basically the way it works is it bundles the ethical options from beta shares into one and they make it cheaper. Hmm. So what they do is they, when, when I spoke to them on the phone, is they pro rata refund the fees that would apply on ETH into, into the, ET, the bigger ETF, the DZZF ETF. Um, and the point is that you can, if you want to, with beta shares, build an ethical portfolio or start the core of your portfolio. It's not, a one, it's not a, like a one-stop shop. Hmm. You would build around it. But you can do that, and that's personally what I'd prefer to do. Yeah, and it's quite interesting as well because Effie has a hedged friend, um, yep. which is called Heth, H-E-T-H, yep. which is where they have a hedge version of Effie. So it's pretty much the same thing, but hedge. So you can, they've really got a few different products that you can bundle together to get different exposures. That's it. Like it, from my understanding of the um, the ETF industry is it's not that much more expensive to do the hedged version or like more complicated while you're creating an ETF, say like Ethi, to do then the hedged version, which kind of cancels out the currency. Obviously, yeah. you with a hedged version, just for those listeners who don't know what hedged means, basically you're trying to remove the impact of currencies going up and down. So for example, if you believed over the next two years that the Australian dollar might fall, would you hedge? Would you unhedge? You would just make that decision. Uh, personally, I don't think I've got any hedged ETFs in my portfolio. Um, but anyway, so DZZF, just as a slight digression, just to highlight this and um, make this an obvious comparison, this ETF invests in ETHI and it invests in FAIR and it also invests in a small bond ETF. Um, there was a question about the bond ETF, which we'll yeah. get to in a minute. Um, but yeah, I just want to highlight that when we talk about fees, that there is another solution there mm. that's cheaper. Yep. And in terms of just quick facts, the distribution is semi-annual mm -hmm. um, and you have full or partial dividend reinvestment plans available, which you can set up through Link Market Services. And it has had quite a high, we were talking about that before, distribution yield over the last few years. Yeah, so if you go, to, this is the thing about ETFs. If you go to the the ETFs website and you look at the, where it's got distributions, just be really careful because Normally, when we talk about a dividend share, let's say we invest in BHP and we log into our brokerage account and it says dividend yield 5%. That dividend yield typically comes back to you through the cash of the, of the business. The business is making a profit. With an ETF, because of the legal structure, it's a fund, it has to distribute things to you. So meaning that it has to send money back your way, even if it doesn't want to, because you are the response, you are the ultimate owner of that investment. And so what can happen is... is it's not necessarily just profits from the companies that are being invested in. It can also be capital gains that are coming back to you. That's why you get that annual member letter from your yep. ETF provider because um, it breaks it all down so you know where to put it on your tax return. So don't be fooled by that necessarily. If you're going to look at something like that, I would encourage you to look at the index provider. So go to the index provider's website, not the ETF, and look and see if they have an estimated yield. Like some of the big ETFs, like I think iShares does this nicely on their website, they have estimated yield. I think Vanguard calls it equity yield. That's just their estimate of the actual dividend, not the capital gains. Yeah. Important and point. yeah, just for performance, I'd recommend going onto the BetaShares FE website. You can have yep. a look at the chart and the table version of the fund returns since inception. So it's a really good idea to look at more than one year uh, of historical performance yep. so you can really get a full view of how everything has returned and look at it with different date timeframes as well. Yeah, so that's, I just want, yeah, let's highlight that again, the, the, the risk statement here, past performance is not indicative of future performance, although, you know, history, the, the, the better saying would probably be history doesn't repeat, 
but it probably rhymes if you look out over a long enough time. Mm-hmm. So the point is that over, say, three or five years, you probably get a better indication of what the annual returns might be. All that said, you raised it before, Kate, this ETF invests a considerable amount in technology and in particular United States listed companies. Yeah, so maybe 71% you can break that down. of the country, of yes. the allocation is in US. Yeah, so that's a big allocation to one country. Yeah. Um, and it's and I'll take the words out of your mouth here, 40% of the ETF at the time that we took this, 31 March 2022, um, you know, 40% of that is in IT and the, the next biggest allocation? Healthcare is yep. 17%, financials 15%. Consumer discretionary, 13%. And then like the fifth biggest allocation is at 4%, which is real estate and everything else is much smaller than that. So I guess it really goes to show how much, if you're investing in this ETF, you're getting a significant exposure to the US investment market and a significant exposure into technology companies. Yeah. So there are some websites around, like Morningstar does this, but also the Vanguard website does this, where you can compare two ETFs side by side. And if you had, for example, let's say you have the IVV ETF, which is the really big one. Um, it's listed all around the world, but it's also here in Australia. If you invested in that ETF, you're getting the USA S&P 500. Then if you put this one also in your portfolio, you're going to get a lot of overlap. We're going to talk mm-hmm. about some companies in a sec, but you're going to get a lot of companies that overlap. So this is where it's also tactical from beta shares because by offering this ETF, what they're effectively saying is give us the majority of your money because, hey, yeah, you might invest in this other ETF, but that doesn't align with you ethically. Mm-hmm. You can still get good exposure to the US by investing in this. But just be mindful, like we see this a lot in portfolios is someone might have like 15 ETFs and they might have like five ETFs that are all invested in technology in the United States. Yeah. Point on the ethical side of things, it's easier to be an ethical company if you're in technology. Yeah. It's a lot easier. Like imagine you're making, I'd imagine you're Google, and you've got a search engine, and then that's one company. And then imagine you're making clothes, like you're making clothes for corporate attire or something. How much easier is it to try and make your business ethical, like run on green energy and stuff, if you Google versus this place that might have a warehouse, might have you know, overseas distribution and supply chains. It gets like it's a lot easier. So that's why in these ethical ETFs, we often end up with a lot of tech. Mm. So as we alluded to with the US, you also want to make sure that you're not just getting outright technology exposure in your portfolio as well. Yeah, it's interesting because when you look at an ASX 200 ETF, you usually have a really high exposure to materials, yeah. which is in here, it's only 0.3%. So yeah. you're stripping out all of that energy production and things like that. And that's that's because this is like, it says it on the tin, right? Like So this ETF is deliberately trying to avoid fossil fuels. So you're not going to get coal heavy businesses. Like one of the things that's in the fact sheet here, which if I just read it, a dollar invested in Ethi's portfolio results in 93% lower carbon emissions than a dollar invested in the Selective Global Developed Market Index. So basically what they're saying is compare these two um, portfolios, you know, 93% lower emissions. And that's because it deliberately avoids, yeah. f- you know, fossil fuels. So mm. yeah, so that's, and that's, that's, that's even in your point is Kate, that you can kind of marry this with a portfolio that might have materials if you're okay with that ethically, mm. of course. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's a good ETF at the end of the day. I think it's mm. so yeah, good. I think it's just important to when you're investing in ethical ETFs, especially one that has a lot more filters. This mm. one does have a lot more filters than some of the other just yep. where they strip out certain things. Um you are getting a larger allocation to certain industries that you wouldn't have had otherwise and US market as well. So I think when you're looking at your overall portfolio diversification, it's really important, especially with ethical ETFs, to look at that portfolio holdings and the sector allocation and even the country allocation to know how this fits in your overall portfolio. That's it. Yeah. So, and that, that's the that's the key point. Like some people ask, how many ETFs do I need? And the key question is, well, what do you want to be invested in basically? And the the way I heard this best put to me was when I was a fund management researcher and the senior analyst at the time would always say, what's the best expression? So what if you're trying to express a view, like I want to invest ethically, that's the expression that I'm trying to capture. How do I express that view in my investment portfolio? And for a lot of people, it comes down to how much time do I have? Um, you know, which companies do I want? Which companies don't I want? And then just try and capture that as efficiently as possible. So you know, we've talked to a few investors recently who basically say this, focus on where you can win. Mm-hmm. Like if you think, okay, I'm going to, I want the best ETF that's investing ethically 
in United States shares, well, this one might be the one. I'm not saying that it is for you, but it might be for someone that listens to yeah. this. And so go and do that. Um, but then in other parts of the portfolio, you, can, you might be a bit more active, a bit more passive, whatever you want to do. Mm. Yeah, and I think the next big question um, is how does beta shares actually screen this portfolio? Yeah. Well, the, the NASDAQ index, but beta shares have worked with them to develop it. So what are the rules? Um, how do they figure out what the top holdings are? Um, that go in there because I'm looking at the top 10 holdings now. It's like a really interesting array of companies, but there is a lot of tech in there. We've got Apple and Visa, MasterCard, there's Home Depot. There's even Toyota Motor Group. So that's another interesting one. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, Adobe, uh, Cisco, and a one you mentioned to me before, which was ASML Holdings. Yeah. So um, did you want me to go through a couple of those names now or did you want to talk about the screening first? I think talk about screening first and then maybe how those companies fall into that. Yeah. Um, But it's I think the screening is the most interesting part when it comes to these ethical ETFs because the reason you're investing in an ethical ETF is because you want to invest in something that aligns with your values in the most case. And so you actually want to find out, does this ETF in the majority align with my values? And so what I'd really want to look at is their guidelines. And so BetaShares actually have a good document, which is called their Exposure Limit Guidelines for BetaShares Ethical Share ETFs. Um, I'll include this link in the show notes because I think that's really important if you're thinking about ethical ETFs to look at these guidelines. But they have the percentage of total revenue in different companies that they will limit. They won't invest in this company if it exceeds this amount of revenue from tobacco production or from junk food, which I thought was interesting. Mm. Um, and even, yeah, things they're looking at things like board, board diversity, even payday lendings mentioned in there, um, gambling, fossil fuels. So this ETF does a little bit more than just... Um, looking for carbon leaders, they also have these other screens as well where they're looking for companies without human rights issues and they're looking for companies that focus on diversity and things like that. Mm. I think that the, the, the ETF providers actually do a pretty good job of getting this information from their index providers, the companies mm. that put the comp- like the portfolio together for them. They actually do a pretty good job of this. BetaShares does a good job of this. Um, not many people know that you can actually click through the websites and find these the way these things are created. And there's sometimes the document's like 20 or 30 pages long yeah. what they look for and how they do it. But I think the, the key differentiator with BetaShares over some of the other ETFs in the market is it actively targets mm. climate leaders. That's what it's targeting. So instead of just saying, we're not going to invest in this, we're not going to invest in this, we're not going to invest in this. It actually says, well, which companies are doing the most? Yeah. And that's one of the key differentiators here. Yeah. Um, and so BetaShares calls these climate leaders. Um, and I think that's a really good approach because it, it can be a bit divisive for some investors because they're actually saying, these are the ones we're targeting. And some investors actually don't like that. It's funny. Some investors don't want to be told what to do. So that's why they prefer the negative screenings from marketing. Mm-hmm perspective but yeah this etf effectively does that and it whittles it all the way down to 200 companies Mm -hmm. um, which are basically these climate leaders yeah and it has a really a four-step screening process from what i can see they firstly they look for global large cap companies global big companies so they're not looking for your 10 million dollar small cap yeah that's it um they're then looking for climate leaders which they describe as companies that are in the top one third of performers in terms of carbon efficiency for their industry or engaged in activities that can help reduce carbon use by other industries. So they then apply that screening. They then look for socially and environmentally uh, acceptable. So they're looking at the other bits of the ESG screening. Mm -hmm. And then they move that down to the largest 200 remaining companies. So, Mm -hmm. and they'll look at all those other factors that um, they have in their exposure limit guidelines document about animal cruelty and alcohol and junk food. So I think that's an important document to have a look at. Not only are you getting the climate leaders, but you're also getting all these other exclusions as well. Yeah. Let's get some examples here because yes. there's some examples that BetaShares includes for us, like Estee Lauder, which people will know for cosmetics and whatever. Um, that's excluded for animal testing reasons uh, for products sold in China. Um, I haven't heard of this company. McKeeson Corporation is facing a multi-billion dollar settlement for its alleged role in the US opioid crisis, which is something you probably wouldn't expect. Like, I'm going to exclude companies that may be involved in, you know, a drug Mm. epidemic or something like that. Uh, Prescription meds, we've all heard about it. Uh, Facebook, excluded for multiple reasons. (laughs) Uh, Coca-Cola, because of the sugary problems, like fizzy drinks are not good for you. Um, And Chevron, 
um, one of the largest polluters in the world. So these are examples that they gave us. Yeah. Um, of what they're excluding from what's their... Then, what's not in the portfolio. Yeah. So I think that's good to... Which would have fallen under a large cap company otherwise. Yeah. And so you can see how it comes down. If think, imagine the filtering process like a filter, like a, a sieve that you have in the kitchen yeah. and it goes through one sieve, through the next one, through the next one. And every time Each there's some knocked out. The holes are a little bit smaller. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And so things get knocked out. And... Maybe we can just talk about a couple of the big positions. Is that yeah, what, what yeah. I know we mentioned a couple in the top 10, but if you wanted to expand on a few. Yeah, so maybe um, you asked me off air, like which companies would I want to talk about? Um, I, I'll be brief because it's, this is more about ETFs than it is about um, individual companies. But Apple's one of the biggest holdings. We all know Apple. And it is very active in like climate and it's mm. got, you know, new buildings. You can go on the Apple website. You can see the like infinity loop and all this sort of stuff. And um Apple's obviously very focused on supply chain too. So the thing is to be mindful is Apple's a hardware and software company. Um, there I've been, have been things over the years, like people, there have been some stories out of different parts of Asia where people that are working on the supply lines for Apple and they've talked about like conditions and whatever. But for the most part, it, it's trying to do the right thing. Uh, NVIDIA is in this portfolio. It's actually the biggest position. Uh, that's probably because it's performed so well. Uh, NVIDIA creates like graphics cards. Uh, which is really interesting because people thought that the shift to away from uh, mobile computing and Apple in particular making its own chips shift away from um, sorry shift away from desktop to mo- mobile computing would have been uh, a big issue for Nvidia. But you know what saved this company for a big period of time? Did games, you know? games, and there's another one, Bitcoin. Oh, right. So yeah. people were buying <laughs> the help. graphics cards from. In like and that we're using like Nvidia technology and using that to mine Bitcoin and mine on the blockchain, because a graphics card is more powerful for this type of computing because it can do thousands, if not more, uh, computations per second, whereas a CPU can only do typically one or two. Like, it, mm. like it does a lot in that second, but that's the idea. Um, some other companies that are in here, uh, ASML Holdings, which a lot of people probably don't know, is made up of a lot of technology company. Uh, technology ETFs. So if we talk about like, graphics cards and people have talked about, sorry, about um, CPUs, about microchips and that sort of stuff, people have talked about there being a shortage. We've heard, you know, the price of electronics is going up because of this. There's been a delay on buying your Xbox or your PlayStation or your computer because of this or iPads are out of stock. This is actually the real reason is that when it comes to microchips, um, semiconductors, that sort of stuff, um, there are only a few players in the world that can do this. Hmm. So Taiwan Semiconductor is one of the big names. Um, obviously, it's very strategically important for com- countries as well. But ASML um, does a really interesting thing in the supply chain of um, semiconductors. Okay, this is a nerdy thing. But it actually creates machines that it only creates. No other companies in the world create. So the, basically, the entire world of electronics is dependent on this business. Right. And this business creates this machine, I, I, I'm going to butcher the science here, but basically like it shoots light through something and it <laughs> shoots onto the microchip and it only, it can, and we're talking like- Sounds very scientific. We're talking about like like nanometers here, like tiny, tiny, tiny little things that go onto these microchips and, um, and onto these boards. And it's just incredible, this machine that they make. And they basically make the machine that then goes into fabs, like the big places where, and the foundries where the semiconductors are made. But they own the machine. And so it's like this, and I'm getting nerdy. You can see the smile on your face. Anyway, it's a super interesting business. ASML, go and look it up. Like if you're investing in Ethi, just have a look at what this company does. Um, And another one that I'll mention here, which is more like Genpop, is Adobe. Everyone knows just Photoshop it. Um, They've got a heap of other, I actually own shares in Adobe, full disclosure, and Apple, and Facebook, and Alphabet slash Google. Um, but Adobe obviously has Photoshop. It has a bunch of other kind of digital experiences that it's trying to build. So it's not just Photoshop. It's not just Adobe Acrobat or like the PDF reader. There is heaps to it. Monique, our producer here, yep, she's nodding. She knows Adobe. Um, you know, you've got Premiere. You've got heaps of different applications um, that come from Adobe. So this is all what you get inside Ethi. Wonderful. So and I just went on a rant. Yes. So for people who are a little bit less interested in the tech but are interested in how that how Ethi could be used in their portfolio, 
Yeah, how could they do it? Yeah. yeah. So would the, you would you consider Effie as a core position? We talk about core and satellite quite a bit on the podcast. Yeah. So I would. Yeah, I would. Um, but again, what I'd defer to is the the diversified ETFs from BHS because yeah. I'm like, why wouldn't I pay half as much, or not quite half as much, but like it's a lot cheaper to also bundle in some Aussie shares. That's the whole. Beta shares are mm. trying to make it so tempting that you really cannot. Um, How much is DZZF management uh, fee at the moment? I'm having a look. I've got it right here in front of me. So the management costs are 0. Oh. 0.39. Wow. So yeah, it's 0. 0.39 versus 0. 0.59. Yeah, but it's much smaller. It's only got 34 million funds it's under still management. Still not a lot of money invested in it. Um, and that could be for multiple reasons. Like people, like financial advisors, uh, don't like it. it's got a limited track record. They might also think that um, why would I do that when I can just build my own? Mm. You know, this yeah, this is an ETF that's still really for new. I'll probably uh, yeah, it's it's an ETF that I really like and one that we recommend. Um, but the, the, at the end of the day, so how would you use Ethi in a portfolio? I think you could use it two ways. You could use it as like your satellite approach, where you have like a tactical, more tactical investment. You say you're investing three to five years out into the future. Or you could build it slowly, build into that core where your dollar cost average. Um, I think the reason why it can be used as both is because if you wanted to push it into your satellite and have it as kind of like a riskier exposure, you could justify that because it is mostly US listed. It's got a lot of tech in there. So it's probably going to have a bit more volatility. But if you wanted it in your core, you could use it as that core global exposure as well. You might want to complement it with something that is a bit more broad. Yeah, but um, you you could use that as well. Um, you could even just use it like let's talk absolute basics. You could use Ethi as your very first investment mm. because you could start with two thousand dollars in in Ethi while you build up and save for the next ETF um, because it aligns with your ethics and it's a good starting point. Yeah. Awesome. And if you are interested in buying units of Ethi, mm. the first step is opening a brokerage account. And I'll link to our two-part series that we did on choosing a brokerage account and setting up your share registry, but even just some names of brokerage accounts. So you've got some floating around when you're doing your research, include Comsec, Stake, Perla, Selfwealth, and Sharesies. So yep. just some different ones to explore when you're getting started, because there are quite a number out there. Yep. Um, and even if you just start by adding one of these ETFs to your watch list, and so you can just keep an eye on it for a while, yep. um, good, you might even add all the five ones that were in the poll just for when you're researching, add them to your watch list just to get you started. Because mm. um, I have mentioned it to a few people when they're really confused and overwhelmed getting started. If you start adding a few things to your watch list, you can go in and have a look. It just sort of reminds you and prompts you to have a further investigation into each of them. Yeah, for sure. And that's it. You've got to use a brokerage account to buy an ETF. Yes. So, um, you can start small. Yeah, you know, that's the key point. You can start small. You don't have to bet the house on it. Um, the names that Kate just brought up there, we're not endorsing any of them, but we're just saying. Um, and we definitely don't options. endorse betting the house on any one thing. No, definitely not. But if when you're starting out, you might only have two thousand yeah. dollars. So if you are, you, you just get started. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So Kate, we've got some. Uh, I guess you could call them comments or questions that have come through. I think we might have answered one or two of them. Yeah, I think when we did the poll in the Facebook community, there were some really interesting comments and suggestions brought up, which I thought we could just address briefly. Some of them probably warrant a little bit more explanation in an episode or something like that for a Q&A. But one of them was more about the ESG landscape and how so many companies now have quite large ownership positions by BlackRock and Vanguard, which yeah. are two of the world's largest ETF index fund providers yeah so basically yeah so you've um the comment was basically like some ceos and board of directors are getting concerned the etf providers are getting so big and then they because they get so big they can elect someone to the board of directors who may have no investing or business experience whatsoever but they have the legal right to appoint mm. someone and so some ceos and boards are being really concerned to give you an example we saw in the last few weeks we're recording this on April 19th, 2022. Um, Elon Musk lodged an acquisition or takeover offer for Twitter. Um, Good publicity he, activity. Yeah, he was going to join the board. Then he didn't. Like Then he launched the takeover offer. Um, 
and the whole the whole thing there was like he was going to take it over it was going to be a bit of a shake up and what have you but then people saw that vanguard was also one of the largest shareholders on the share registry of twitter mm. and they're like what's this vanguard thing like who are they and what do they think and the i the, the a lot of people miss the point that vanguard holds money on behalf of the etf and index fund investors so if you own some of this the, the global vanguard fund just making something up you might have a tiny, tiny, tiny little ownership in Twitter and Elon Musk is trying to take over your company. And how do they deal with that? Well, a lot of the times the ETF providers and the index fund providers have a set rule on how they vote on things, how they make decisions. But yeah, it's an interesting thing. And for the ESG part of this, um, I guess it comes back to how does the index fund prov- index provider and the, the, the ETF issuer deal with these issues they normally have a corporate governance team yeah and even as we've spoken to some people from super funds they've often got their own corporate governance rules on how they um, yeah. in, um, talk to companies and vote on issues which i think is really interesting if you are a bit more um, involved in how etfs and your super fund are run asking for how they vote and yeah. deal with companies on key issues especially if um, they're slightly more activist funds or ETFs because some of the st- super funds do get more actively involved in different yeah, companies. Do. So it is it is a good thing to ask and they will probably be able to tell you how they will vote and how they either, if they're passive or they're a bit more of an activist approach. Yeah, and they do have documents on this too. Some of the big super funds, so not necessarily ETF providers, but some of the big super funds tell you how they vote. They have like a record of how they yeah. voted, how they've engaged with stakeholders too, like individual companies. Um, yeah, and this is going to become a bigger and bigger issue going forward but what we'll see is that the index fund providers as a proxy for their individual investors like us they will take stances as well they'll have to um, and we'll see that more and more come on yeah um there was also another comment saying are they really ethical all of these etfs or are they just being sold with pretty lights and sparkles yeah. which i think we've had a look and some of them are a bit more of just the pretty lights and sparkles but i think this one um I mean, it really depends what your values are, but it does seem to take a much uh, more serious approach to the way it screens out companies. It does, yeah. And at the end of the day, like we said at the top of the show, unless it identifies with you exactly, like your yeah. ethics, if you got it in our ethical investing course, we have this document that you can download and it's basically got like all of the things that you care about and you tick the box And basically what it's trying to do is trying to help you identify your investing values Mm. or like how your personal values and then reflected into your investing. Because a lot of people say that they're an ethical investor but then and they don't want to invest in fossil fuel, but then they have an ETF that invests in it. Yeah. And I think even getting their exposure limit guideline, it's just a one page A4 document. If you just go through that list, there's about 10, 15 Mm. things mentioned there. Well, what do you have a viewpoint on alcohol production? Do you have a viewpoint on animal cruelty? Do you have a viewpoint on tobacco production? Like you can go through all of these items and go, where do I stand on each of those issues? Do I stand in a similar enough position to how beta shares stand for this ETF to be the right one for me? And it might not be, and you might have to go hunting. Mm. Yeah, and that's the thing. Yeah, you you might have to. And I think that's a that's a good point. Is like you might close enough might be good enough. Yeah, I don't think you're ever going to find something that's 100% in line with your values because there's so many issues they're looking at and that's not all the issues. So yeah. you're never going to find the perfect match if you're looking for an ETF or a super fund. There's always going to be a company or a issue that you're not perfectly aligned on. But I think if you're looking for an ETF um, to invest in that's ethical, you're going to have to make some mm. choices eventually. There's So there's an option for you. You can be an individual share investor and you can just go invest in companies like Apple, for example, if that's what you wanted to invest in because it Mm -hmm. aligns with it ethically. But there is actually something emerging here in Australia, which has been in the United States for about five to 10 years, which is called direct indexing or um, it has different flavors. But basically the idea is that you would be able to log in to your ETF provider and select your own amounts. So like let's say as a hypothetical example, this isn't here yet, by the way, this is a sign of things to come. When you buy an ETF, uh, you basically are, beholden to those rules Mm. so for example 20 percent of revenue can't come from fossil fuels i don't know example right you might log into this new age investment um firm into their website and you might say i only want five percent and then it will automatically calculate an index for you and that will be your portfolio yeah so you get kate's ethical index yeah that's it so you could then modify it yourself Mm. so that's something that's coming down the line but until then 
it's basically, yes, yeah, some of them are ethical, but a lot of them, I don't know who asked this question or made this point, a lot of them are sparkles. Yeah. And there are a few other comments about comparing some different ethical ETFs, looking at active ethical ETFs. So if you are interested, I think we can definitely do another episode that maybe we deep dive Mm. on a range of ethical ETFs and compare them and how they could all fit together and building an ethical ETF portfolio and what does that look like. Yeah, that's it. Um, There was a uh, question about like doing individual comparisons. Yeah, you you can become a member of our service, which is RASC ETFs. That's probably... The easiest, like, just ask this question there and I'll include it in the monthly. Um, but we've looked at all the eth- ethical ETFs. We've looked at all the um, index funds, the share, uh, Australian shares, international, and we've come up with the portfolios. So those are our chosen ones and uh, you can find out more by being a member. But yeah, I guess there's so many different ETFs we can talk about. We're going to talk about at least six more over the next year. So yeah, yeah. Well, so right we into us, yeah. <laughs> and we're going to talk about six more shares too. Yeah. So, um, can- and if you are interested in learning more about... This particular ETF, Ethi, I definitely recommend starting on the BetaShares website. Just Google Ethi ASX and you'll find the page on the ASX website and the page on BetaShares website. They have heaps of information guides because it's a a different kind of ETF. So they've got a lot of information and how it all works and what the science is and what Mm. they're doing that's different. Um, We also have more information on ETF investing and ethical investing Mm -hmm. um, on our RASC education site in our courses. So they're a fantastic resource and I'll include them in the show notes. And of course, if you want to join our ETF membership service, it's lifetime membership to get started. You can use the coupon code AFP for the Australian Finance Podcast and you only have to pay $49, which is a steal. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, We actually do get a lot of people just signing up organically. Like we don't do our memberships, which is pretty cool. Like I know you and I check this. Um, And yeah, we've got like, just to reiterate, Kate said, we've got the ethical investing course, we've got the ETF investing course. Use the BetaShares website. Use the best ETFs website. Use Rask Education. There's so many resources. You'll see it all in the show notes. But um, this is a good ETF. At the end of the day, it's a good ETF. Um, I would encourage you to compare it with the DZZF ETF. Um, There are, there's one from Van Eck, which is pretty good. There's the, uh, there's a bunch of different ethical or sustainable ETFs out there now, and it's great to see them coming along. I think we should reinforce that point. Yeah. No, it is fantastic yeah. that there's more options and more different filters because it is still hard. You, there's not an option to have your own filter unless you're individual share investing. So yeah. it is a good idea to compare different ones and really sink your teeth in and do your research if this is an area that interests you. Yeah. And if you are investing for the long term, which we are, um, why not invest ethically? One of the things we haven't talked about, it's mentioned in the course is it doesn't cost the earth, is in returns, to invest ethically. Some, there's this kind of misconception that if you invest in an ethical portfolio, you're going to give up because all tobacco companies and gambling companies make super profits. That may be the case, but some of these companies are also great too. So, I mean, Apple. Wonderful. Well, I think we should wrap up there, Owen, but yes, thank yes. you everyone for listening. Yes, Kate, as always, thanks for joining me.